Hello, my name is Gwen Holdman. I'm the director of the Alaska Center for Energy and Power at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and I'm the host for your ARENA webinar series. Today, we're gonna to be talking a little bit about diesel powerhouse systems, which are the heart of most microgrids throughout the Arctic. We recently had a chance to speak with two individuals who have decades of experience with these kinds of systems, John Cameron and David Lockard. John Cameron is the vice president for Marsh Creek LLC, which has decades of experience in designing diesel powerhouses both in Alaska and around the world. David Lockard is a professional engineer and project manager with the Alaska Energy Authority who has experience with developing bulk fuel plants and diesel powerhouses for the Alaska Energy Authority. We'll start with a quick overview from John. The diesel power plant uh, is a module that uh, contains a diesel generator set uh, that also has its own control system, um, an electrical distribution system. It is self-contained and unsupported by any other uh, outside grid. Its purpose is primarily is to provide power for the, uh, the remote villages. Uh, with that, there's a, a whole host of issues that go with that because of the remoteness and the, and the difficulty, especially during the winter months. Typically, the sizes range from as low as 35 kW to, uh, on average, on the high side, one and a half megawatts. The uh, important part of that whole scenario is, is the fuel storage that's required to keep the uh, power plant in production year-round. It takes a lot of scheduling and a lot of maintenance for the, uh, the bulk storage systems that are associated with uh, these, these remote power plants. Some of them are, uh, are, are built on site. The vast majority in today's environment are pre-manufactured uh, um, outside of, of uh, that particular area and then they're, they're transported to the site. Before we talk about the power plants themselves, let's hear from David about how the diesel fuel actually is delivered to most of these communities in the Arctic. Well, there are over 200 villages in rural Alaska. Almost all of them are located on uh, near the ocean or along a river bank. And so the vast majority of the fuel gets delivered by fuel barge. Some of those barges are very large ones that travel across the ocean. Some of them are smaller ones that go up and down the rivers, like the Yukon River or the Kuskokwim River. Those villages that can't receive fuel by barge, which is in general the cheapest way to get it, they are often served by air tankers. These are actually airplanes that carry big, big fuel tanks in them, and they uh, deliver fuel year-round by air in increments of uh, between two and 5,000 gallons at a time. And then the third common way of delivering fuel is by tanker truck, like you might see in Anchorage or in the lower 48. Those tanker trucks often travel on ice roads that are built specifically for the purpose of allowing vehicles to get into those communities in the wintertime. And the vast majority of the fuel comes by barge, and the barges uh, only have access to the villages during the summertime when there's not ice on the rivers or even on the ocean. Those villages have to store enough fuel to get through the winter and in some cases to last a year because the barge might only come once a year. That means that even the smaller villages store hundreds of thousands of gallons of fuel and they store them in bulk fuel storage facilities, which include many tanks of uh, between 10,000 and 50,000 gallons of capacity each. So as a result of these long transportation lines, small markets, and often a lack of competition, fuel prices can be quite high for many of these communities. These high fuel prices add up to high energy costs for most places in the Arctic. For example, in Alaska, in 2015, the average cost for a kilowatt hour of electricity was 49 U.S. cents per kilowatt hour. About half of this cost was specifically due to the cost of fuel in these communities. Clearly, operating these systems as efficiently as possible is very important. John Cameron gives some insights into the specific components that are part of a typical diesel powerhouse system. Well, you're, you're operating a miniature uh, utility that's comprised of a, a diesel engine, prime mover, a generator, a cooling system, exhaust system, and a control system. The exhaust system uh, exits the module uh, through the side of the wall or the roof. The cooling system requires a large radiator, much like a, a, a truck that you see on the highway. 
you have a fuel system that, that obviously delivers the fuel to the engine. And, uh, and you have to have a, a means for combustion air within the module itself. And those are the, the components. We also asked John to describe what makes these powerhouses as efficient as possible. Diesel engines are inherently 30% efficient. One gallon of diesel fuel has approximately 140,000 BTU. One third of that is consumed by the engine to generate the power to create the electricity. One third of it goes to the cooling system of the engine, and the last third is expelled via the exhaust system through the muffler that exits through the, either the, the a side wall or through the roof. The question is, how do we increase the efficiency of that particular system? The easiest way is to capture the heat from the cooling system itself. That's the easiest and most direct route to go. We do that through utilizing a heat exchanger that's located between the engine and the radiator and, and that you create an outside loop where you can use this energy that is normally expelled through the radiator and redirect it to a heating system for a home or a, a community center. Uh, you can actually preheat boilers uh, and save energy in that regard. The one thing that you can do that enhances that particular part of the heat recovery system is use an engine that has a marine exhaust manifold on it. Now you're beginning to collect some of the BTU that's normally expelled through the exhaust system and introducing that into the jacket water cooling system. So as you go along with these, uh, these ideas, you collect additional heat energy uh, from systems that otherwise expel it to the atmosphere. Keeping the fuel clean and keeping up with all scheduled service requirements is the one item that you can control for increased efficiency. Typically, these systems work best when electric load is in the genset's optimum efficiency range. When the demand for its power is less than that, it can lead to lower system performance. This sensitivity varies with engine type and size. Newer gensets, which have electronic fuel injection and governors, provide higher efficiency and a wider peak efficiency power band. Regardless of the engine type, it's important to make sure the engine capabilities are well matched to the expected power requirements and that consideration is given to how the loads will vary over time. They can change significantly from moment to moment as different loads come on and off across the grid throughout the day. The load uh, variation seasonally can be incredibly wide between high and low. You have a lot, a lot of things that influence that, the, the natural environment, weather patterns, temperature, uh, daylight versus nighttime, changes in, in industrial loads if you have any, but more particularly uh, seafood processors and schools. Like many other places in the world, residents in Arctic communities are interested in incorporating local renewable resources whenever possible. There are many kinds of renewable resources across the Arctic. In Alaska, we've primarily focused on developing hydro, wind, and solar for rural villages. These are intermittent resources, which means they're variable. It, they're not resources you can turn on when you want them or turn off when you don't want them. It's not like firewood, which you can stack in the corner and use when you need it. Uh, typically, with these renewable resources, you use them when they're available, and when they're not, you have to back them up with diesel powerhouses. That kind of a challenge with renewable resources makes it interesting and sometimes complicated to integrate them into diesel powerhouses. Renewable energy resources and our integration with diesel powerhouse systems is discussed in more detail in future ARENA webinars. For more information on this topic or to leave questions or comments, please visit our website. We also have additional information there on future ARENA webinars, as well as our on-site program. Thank you.